Hello, everyone. It's Brian of Tiny Crypto Blog. And today is Friday, January 12th, 2024. It'll be short, sweet, simple, and all about the ETFs this week because they were finally approved. So going to the price action here, we can see across the board, once we had the pump in prices and the ETF approvals, Bitcoin go up, coins go up. If we were to take a look at just Bitcoin action in and of itself, we had the pump of last week and then we had Wednesday's false alarm when the SEC, and I think my guess was it was someone internal, played around, had the fat finger, and if it truly was a two-factor authentic authentication hack, then uh, it was someone internal. That's my guess. And subsequent price drop. And then here we are, where in the last 24 hours, prices have been 47,000 range. And apparently, there's been quite a deal of... Uh, trading volume on the ETFs. That was the prices recap. Bitcoin ETFs, finally. So a three to two vote, they were approved. Gary Gensler still put out, we're approving them, but we still don't think they're safe. So who knows what motivations lie behind his words, whether he is doing this for his own sake or it was a case of, I think it was a case of, he had to respond to the pressures coming from the Black Rocks and the Fidelities and everyone who said, we want this product. We want the money. We want the scrape. We want to jump on board. And so the net result was it got passed and he had a foul expression like he just took nasty medicine or castor oil. And so it goes. And it was a very event-filled day. Uh, it was also the 15th anniversary. There's a famous tweet uh, by longtime contributor to the project, Hal Finney, where he put out a tweet saying, running Bitcoin. He was one of the earliest people who were connected with the Bitcoin project to run a node and uh, mine Bitcoin. And... The approval the day they came live was on the day the 15 year anniversary of that event and there's just so much drama where everything went live today the day after the announcement that things were going live so everything was in place i think all 10 went going and the big ones the big fish are grayscale BlackRock and Fidelity so far. Um, in a recent podcast with Natalie Brunel and her coin stories and the two journalists, the one at Bloomberg and another gentleman, I don't remember what media outlet he was with. They were talking about the Bitcoin ETFs, approval processes, IDs, and that sort of thing. One of the things they were saying was when you look at ETFs come out you know, for a particular item, what ends up happening is that you'll have one or two or maybe three that are essentially are the big fish that end up being the ones that kind of act as the index to trade. In grayscale, definitely has a leg up on the competition. I can kind of see with its place and standing how, and I don't know what stories we'll see come out in the months ahead about Barry Siebert being pushed out of the board of uh, Digital Currency Group. We'll see how that unfolds and what implications that has. But definitely, I'd say that was one of the conditions of getting the go, just the same as having Binance uh, put into place and having CZ knocked down. And then 
coming up to the part that I'm looking forward to talking about is, okay, now that we have the ETFs, what comes next? I'm going to be reading them periodically and bouncing off my notes here. So with Bitcoin ETFs, they're going to be amplifiers. Because what we're, what's happening is we're having, ugh, we're having a lot of additional demand come into the space through derivatives, where through derivative demand, you have got, there we go. Through derivative demand, you have got uh, demand for the actual asset where people buy and sell to may, may match the corresponding value, those ETFs have to buy or sell the Bitcoin. So when there's a bull market, when there's a bear market, there's going to be amplified demand as people add to their positions and also sell their positions. So we're going to see that effect. Also, too, because we've got this scale of buy, buying, that's going to add liquidity to the actual Bitcoin ecosystem itself, where through exchanges, through OTC, whatever whatever means, there's going to be added liquidity because there are going to be some people, it's not just the ETFs, but you're also going to have people who don't want to go through the ETF and they go through a Coinbase, they go through a crack and they go through a Binance and buy and sell the Bitcoin directly. So that's going to have, when you have higher liquidity, the price swings are a lot harder to achieve. Where if you think about an exchange and how within a price range of trading, buying and selling and what people want, you're going to have at each price point, Instead of, say, 10 buyers at a given price point, you're going to have 100, 1,000. And that means those prices are going to move less and less because the demand at a certain price range is more and more. So the buyers and sellers will adjust their pricing because they want to move their positions to match whatever that is. So we'll see probably over a longer term the volatility and pricing go down. Now, how it plays out in the long-term four-year cycle that we've witnessed up to this point? I don't know. That remains to be seen. Another effect, and this one, uh, I'm sort of paraphrasing because I haven't done the hardline research yet, but it was mentioned in a meme of all places that when gold ETFs came about, it was at the beginning of the aughts, like around 99, 2000, somewhere around there, 2001. And I remember because I had some shares in a gold mutual fund being the contrarian that I was. And they had the, the price of gold steadily went up from the three to 350 range every year. It just kept steadily going upward and upward and upward until it reached that huge climactic peak when commodities went nuts in 2007 and I want to say it hit somewhere in the $1,200, $1,500 range, somewhere in there, which you know was blowing out the all-time highs. And one of the things attributed to that was that you had steady demand from gold ETFs, where you had one and then another one comes online. And that just creates a demand where if someone's just building positions, whether it's uh, a retirement fund that owns shares of this mutual fund and this mutual fund and this mutual fund or that stock, that stock, that stock or whatever. Within that layer, those layers of investment were shares in a gold ETF to get exposure to the precious metals market. And that was a slow add-on of positions. And that's what we're going to see play out over time in a long-term trend is now these Bitcoin ETFs are out there. People are going to start talking, investment advisors slowly over time, and it'll be accelerated by the next bull cycle in prices. That interest and that uh, periphery buying 
is going to start happening and that's going to start building up the price levels and raising the floor. So we'll see how that plays out over the long term. Uh, by the sheer numbers of what we've got in the ecosystem, we're going to have more freedom tech come in. And I'm going to add a banner for that. Meaning you're going to have all the full coiners who are basically buying derivatives of Bitcoin. Those numbers are going to increase and they're always going to be the majority. Always, always, always. They're going to be the majority the same way that the people who are enthusiastic about HTML and TCP IP, which is all internet jargon, is a thin majority. But yet they're influential in what happens with those protocols. Same thing with Bitcoin. You're going to, the majority of people, they're going to have exposure to it. They'll have you know ETFs. They'll have derivative products. But they're not going to be the people like you and me who understand Bitcoin's properties, what its value is to everyday human interaction, to us financially, socially, uh, in all the multitudes of ways, its characteristics and properties, being censorship resistant, peer-to-peer, -peer, global, digital. Uh, but just as every bull cycle and also every new person, it's, it's just the compound effect. It's just the compound effect, whether it's Someone stumbling across it and being inspired to learn about Bitcoin, someone who's an engineer, someone who's a philosopher, someone who is an economist, someone who focuses on monetary policy, your Lynn Aldens, your Jeff Booths, your, uh, I can't remember the one engineer's name, that guy, you know, all these people. And then their audiences get exposed to Bitcoin or the people who buy an ETF or who just like it clicks and they chase the price. And then they start getting curious about the freedom tech. They get curious about its characteristics, you know, the things that drove and continues to drive Bitcoin's, what I argue, or what I'll fight for saying its main value proposition that makes it more than just an NFT and a scarce digital asset. It's that it's those characteristics of that protocol. The numbers from that are going to grow. It'll be the minority as it is now, as it'll be as we achieve a greater, as Bitcoin expands further into global consciousness, the numbers of the faux coiners are, it's going to become a larger and larger percentage of the majority, but also the number of, freedom tech people that's going to grow and the effects that their decisions make i think will be amplified almost like uh best way to put it united states you are representative in congress the size of number of people in your district as the u.s population grows so does the number of people you represent in your district grow and thereby your vote within the legislative body carries that much more weight of impact. It's the same thing with the people in the freedom tech and the people who get involved in the forums and really get into the weeds on this stuff. So we've got that. All right. Next one. What other derivative products? Derivatives. Next, what other derivative products are coming next? I don't know. We'll have to find out. We'll have to see what is what, because I'm sure there's going to be some sort of innovations. We already have a futures-based ETF. We already have a spot ETF. We're probably going to see the products such as, um, I imagine that, include an ETF in it, like we're going to see a technology. This will be, again, all the periphery stuff where you have a technology ETF that includes a little bit of a Bitcoin ETF. We're going to see a blockchain 
mutual fund that or ETF that's got shares of the Bitcoin ETFs. We're going to see the 2070 retirement, you know, uh, Investigo retirement fund or Fidelity retirement fund, a long-term retirement fund that has shares of a Bitcoin ETF in it and things like that. But as far as other types of investment vehicles built on top of it, I don't know. We'll have to see. We're going to see where human ingenuity and incentives to earn a buck will take things. That's where it's going to get interesting. And then spilling into that, we are going to talk about Ethereum ETFs and beyond. So there's already been applications for Ethereum ETFs. Uh, Grayscale has the GETH, I think the ticker symbol is, which is an Ethereum trust. And its performance has always sucked because it's usually been at a premium or it just, the price action just sucks. But that would become probably convert over since Bitcoin ET uh, trust converted over, this would probably be converted over as well. So I could see success, and I want to say this is at least three to six months down the road. I could see the success of spot Bitcoin ETFs laying the groundwork for Ethereum ETFs. And depending on how well the Bitcoin ETFs do could determine the overall interest in Ethereum ETFs. But then the question comes into play. Multiple questions come up like, what would an Ethereum ETF do to the ecosystem? Because Ethereum, I think as it is right now, is a lot more sensitive to transaction fees. Uh, if you've got this additional trading, trading, for ETFs on volume, even if the purchases are done in an OTC to change hands, to change wallets, you still need the on-chain transactions. That's going to lead to additional usage of block space, adding pressure to the fees. And also we need to ask, what's this going to do as far as staking? Because if you think about the exchanges, they take a good deal of the ETH that they have, and they're running nodes. They're, you know, why, why wouldn't they? They're incentivized, just like individual players, to stake ETH because you can get, you can grow your stack by 3 to 4% a year. Why wouldn't you? And if you got an exchange and you've got dozens of wallets, if you're an ETF and you've got dozens of wallets, why wouldn't you? You're going to grow your stack by that much, which also means you don't have to buy that ETH. That's the protocol is giving you what you need and anything in excess you have, you can sell, you can monetize that. So we'll see what that does as far as staking goes, but also too, with Ethereum, what does the ownership and the control of wallets that has sizable chunks how does that affect voting? How does that affect the control of the direction of the protocol itself? It's almost like a blessing in disguise that a lot of the people still involved in the project have a good chunk of that from the ICO in their, under their control. Now, I know, oh gosh, I can't remember the Twitter account. There are questions and there's evidence pointing towards, which in this may or may not be anything to even worry about, um, Chinese-based entities who hold a large chunk of ICO Ethereum. So I don't know what that could mean. You know, is it, is it, People who are generally inter interested in freedom tech? Is it combative bodies that are not necessarily friendly towards American governmental or military or social interests or what have you? I don't know. 
Uh, but when he can take, you know, what the question is too, because the Ethereum developers, I'm stretching a little as far as my knowledge base on this, but because you have a more centralized team that is working on the evolutionary pro, uh, upgrades in the protocol, how can they be influenced? How can they be squeezed? How can they be either honey or vinegared, stick or carroted into certain features being added or kept out of future upgrades? We don't know. We'd have to find out. With institutional money, we're going to find out. But these are serious risk vectors that we need to that need to be considered in advance. Uh, and then another thing that you know why this is important is because when you look at just the sheer scope of what operates on top of Ethereum, all the second and third layers solutions and protocols. That is a huge ecosystem now. A lot of these protocols are operating on other blockchains. And if people are incentivized by whatever reason, excuse me, to move to a different platform, Solana, Avalanche, whatever it is, they'll do it. But then you have to ask, okay, if there's going to be an Ethereum ETF, one of the other questions was, what other protocols are going to have their tokens uh, have derivatives built in the form of an ETF? And if not a direct ETF, maybe it's a basket. Maybe it's a smart chain ETF. Maybe it's certain protocols like Ethereum and Solana and Cardano. Or maybe it's a basket because uh, Grayscale, they have a basket trust i think it's like six or seven different protocols and that could be turned into an etf you know just like a basket so you know these are risk vectors to consider especially too if you consider the effects whether it's through direct or indirect effects of DeFi tokens and dow tokens because we have to consider if you own tokens in one of those protocols, what does the base, you have to look at the risk vectors for the base layer protocol that these are built on. So that's something to consider. But that's down the road. And there'll be a lot of news headlines and a lot of drama and a lot of back and forth before these things even happen. The Bitcoin ETFs just went live on Thursday. So we need to see how all that unfolds, how the pricing markets unfold, where they go in the first and second quarter of this year, and then how does that affect Ethereum ETFs? And then we'll see where the Ethereum ETFs go. And so this will be an evolving story. It's something just to keep your eyes open for. And... Uh, yeah, but thankfully, 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 my God, the Ethereum, ET all the Bitcoin ETF drama is done and we can move on to the next chapters. Uh, and as I'm saying in the banner, Bitcoin is eating the world and this is what it looks like. So let's wrap it up. You can follow. Tiny Crypto blog via the links in the show notes. Uh, I'm on Twitter. We have, I have posts going out on Facebook, Twitter, uh, occasionally pieces on Medium. YouTube's got a lot of activity of shorts. Also cross-published on BitChute, Odyssey, Brighteon, and I, oh, oh and, uh, Anchor FM slash Spotify slash whatever cross platforms Spotify cross publishes on. So you can catch the 
pure audio versions of all these videos. And with that, be well, everyone. Talk to you soon.